<laughs> this is my dev talk on Helix Pi. So, ask questions throughout this. Uh, and, yeah. What is Helix Pi? What is Helix Pi? <laughs> Why am I making it? How does it work? What is my ultimate evil master plan? Relatively quickly. So, Helix Pi is a way to make games without writing code. Specifically, it's a tool that runs in your browser. It's written entirely in JavaScript, and it's like made with KiwiJS and you know, a few other things, um, and it's a node module. It's far from finished. I've been working on it like all the time outside of work for the last two months, and it's still like not even not even really something you'd want to use yet. So, when I say without writing code, I'm not talking about a graphical interface for creating code that you know isn't just writing code into a file. There are lots of things out there like that, like Game Maker and Stencil and MIT Scratch and Gamefruit. And there's also things like Cucumber, where you write like plain English things, and then a developer needs to actually write code underneath that. So I consider all of these things to be coding. Like when you ask someone to do this, you're asking them to apply the same skill set that it takes to be a coder. Um, Cucumber is kind of an exception, but you still need someone to write the code to make it go go. Helix Pi, no code at all. So, why am I making that? It sounds like a ridiculous thing to make, so I think I should start with that. Um, making games is incredibly hard. I started out making games, that's how I got into programming, and I very much remember what it felt like to not know how to program at all and start making things with little drag and drop blocks and stuff. And I kind of consider code to be a fundamentally flawed way of expressing the behavior involved in games. For anyone that doesn't know, the way that modern games are written for the most part, we're talking about real-time games here, not so much like the turn-based sort of games you might make on the dev train. Um, games run at 60 frames a second usually, and every time you hit a frame, this is a bit of a simplification, um, it runs through all of the objects in your game, they have a little update method, they change their state, it re-renders, and then it does the next frame. So you effectively have to rep, like, think about how can I construct this game out of a bunch of objects that update a tiny amount 60 times a second. And it's a really unintuitive way for humans to reason about the behavior of games. It's fine for expressing simulations, but games are a different thing. So how does it work? The real question I had to ask myself is, how can I describe a game so that both humans and computers can easily understand it? So that humans can easily express themselves and then computers can turn that into code. I had a really good conversation with my friend Patrick uh, a while ago. He, he's a plumber, and he asked me what I was working on, and I told him about this. I told him it's a way of making games without writing code. Normally, you have to write code to make games. And he said, ah, so it's a program that writes code for you. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what it is, exactly. So uh, we're just going to step back for a little bit and think about how it works. So we're going to think about how does Mario work? And when I say, how does Mario work, I'm thinking, at a mechanical level, what are the behaviors that Mario exhibits to the game? The first one that you'll probably encounter when you play Mario is that if you press the right arrow, your character moves to the right. The other really important one, I suppose, is that if you press the up arrow, your character jumps. So I've expressed two really simple mechanics of Mario, two really simple behaviors of the character in such a way that you all can understand it. It wasn't very hard for me to make those little animations. They're really just, you start here, you go there, some input happens in between. So I can express the behavior of a game in a really easy to understand way. But it's how can computers possibly take that sort of information and produce code? First, I want to think, like, what would the code for that look like? This is, once again, a bit of an oversimplification. Um, everything's going to be JavaScript, by the way. Uh, so if you, we want to check if the right button is down, and if it is, we want to select, set our x velocity to 3 so that we move to the right. And if the left button's down, we move to the left. I never actually had an animation for that. And if you press up, you want to set your velocity.y to negative 10 so that you go, woo, and then hopefully there's some gravity in there. I'm just assuming we have gravity in our scene. Um, and also, this has a bug already in that you would be able to jump while you're in the air. Uh, just by pressing up. That's everyone's first favorite bug when you're making a platformer. But we're just going to ignore that for the moment. So how would I turn those animations from before into code? How would I like do that? It seems kind of ridiculous. Now, the obvious answer is, of course, infinite monkeys. This is a thousand monkeys working at a thousand typewriters. Soon, they'll have written the greatest novel known to man. It was the best of times. It was the blurst of times. You stupid monkey. <laughs> you shut up. Uh, but actually, like seriously, go to the Wikipedia page for the infinite monkey theorem and read it and scroll down to the bit where Richard Dawkins is talking about how you could like break, you know, do things all differently. Nothing I'm doing in this project is a new idea is what I'm really saying here. It's just a new application of old ideas. So 
It seems like infinity is a bit long though. Like if you're just going to make a program that randomly generates code that does stuff. I don't know if any of you have heard of BOGO sort. Uh, it's the best sorting <laughs> algorithm ever made. Uh, for anyone that's unfamiliar, pretty much you take an array of numbers, you sort them randomly, you check if they're sorted, and if they are, they return it. Um, I think to sort a list of like numbers that's three or four long, I've seen it take four hours to run, and like if you get to six or seven, it's just like literally months and months. University professors seem to like BOGO sort for some reason. I can't imagine why. Um, yeah, but. So uh, it, we need a way of cutting down that infinity to something within my lifetime, hopefully. So the way that we do that is with evolution. A slide is a little bit dense, but this is pretty much how Helix Pi works. So we take all of those animations that we've provided, that our users have created, we generate a whole bunch of monkeys that have random behaviors, we simulate the monkeys, and then we check how close what they've done is to the animation that the user describes. We can then use that as a fitness algorithm for the monkeys, and this is like actual Darwinian evolution. This is the like Darwin's theory of evolution applied to computer programs. And so we take all of the best monkeys, we breed them together, and then we repeat the process with a newly bred generation of monkeys. And ideally, the really good traits, the things, the behaviors that are actually what you've expressed in your animations will show up over time and you'll just get better results. So um, I'm going to go into some code into how HelixPy actually works. So, Wait, um, sorry, um, yeah, sure. what is the genetics or what is the genetics of your thing? Um, how, how do you evolve? Like, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> what does a Helix Pi program look like? So, a Helix Pi program is an array of functions. So, we have three functions inside of an array. Um, in JavaScript, functions are first class objects, so you can do, treat them in any way that you would a normal object. Uh, you can assign things to them, and you know, it's great. Um, so, Helix Pi, it's really simple. Um, you just have functions that take in an entity and an API. Uh, API is a really bad variable name. Roger and Andy are probably quite sad on the inside right now. But um, pretty much the API is all of the things that a Helix Pi program can do. So they can set velocity, they can apply force, they can check buttons down, they can check collisions, they can check their position. Um, so the genes, this, this is an individual, this is a monkey effectively. The genes are a function. Like, each of these functions in my system is a gene. And I say that both in terms of like, that is my domain terminology. But if you think about it, um, we have DNA, and DNA is a sequence of data. And life is effectively the virtual machine that executes your DNA, and the result is you. Uh, which is pretty much the same for Helix Pi programs, which is kind of a cool way of thinking about things. So it starts to raise some interesting questions, like how does breeding work? So Breeding works in a quite a simple way at the moment. You take two monkeys. This is the dad. This is the mum. Color coded them for clarity and you know gender roles. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, actually, if this was before the 1950s, this would be the dad and this would be the mum. But you know, pink and blue swapped around. That's a fun, fun piece of reading. So we slap them together into one array. So previously they were two arrays, and now they're just one array. We pick a random point in the middle. It's called a crossover point. And now we have two different monkeys, and those are the children. That is how breeding works in Helix Pi. Oh. The entire thing. Um, and that this is the code. I'm glad you made that noise just now. That's why I put that title there. <laughs> so you always have two children? Yep, so you take two parents in, and you always get two children. There are different ways of doing breeding. Um, currently, Helix Pi is quite simple in that the programs are just an array of functions. In genetic programming, usually you actually want to model your individuals as a tree of functions, and then the crossover is really just you take one node in the tree and you swap it with another node in the tree, and that has like effectively the same sort of thing. But yeah, um, this isn't really a good way of doing things, but it does does work. Yeah. Um, any questions about that? How do you choose? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, uh, the garbage collector does my uh, deals with my sins for me. But um, I do. I, I'm, I'm concerned that there might be a memory leak, so maybe they live forever. Who knows? Um, uh, no, no, no. How do you how do you select them? Oh yeah, I should go to my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Um, he paid me five bucks for this. <laughs> <laughs> so pretty much the way that I tell how fit a monkey is. Earlier on when I talked about those animations, and from a like data point of view, those animations are expressed as we have a bunch of different objects in our scene and we want to take we want to take them to take different paths. So the Mario one would just be it starts at x0, y0, and then at frame 60 it should be at x100, y0. 
And so the fitness function is called every time, like you start out, you run the simulation until you get to one of those expected positions. Then you stop, you take the entity and the expected position, which are both just effectively x, y coordinates, and then you return the distance. Um, this little thing here, for any of those, anyone that doesn't notice, is uh, the Pythagorean theorem, and it is literally just the distance between two coordinates. Um, the thousand is an arbitrary number I picked when I first wrote this, and it's yeah. So you'll you'll see like the, a perfect entity has a fitness of a thousand. But um, I realized the other day what the number actually means. And if you have a fitness of 900, it means that at any given point, you are on average 100 pixels away from where you should be, which is not actually as good as I thought it was. So <laughs> probably going to make that number smaller. <laughs> High science going on here. Um, yeah. Have you considered using the, the multiple fitness functions used in GP? Uh, I am not really sure. Like, like could you? Elaborate mean squared, and there's a couple of others that are a little less locked into their kind of coordinate based, like a, just a different way of expressing fitness. Yeah, so um, I the way that I think about it at the moment is that Helix Pi is very much a generic way of generating programs that behave in a certain way when provided with certain input. Um, which seems like overly abstract, but I am specifically using it for game development at the moment. So it makes sense to have a fitness function that checks that entities move in a certain way, and that's where distance comes into it. But there are other properties that are like required as games move on. Like um, if I want to make, for example, asteroids, my objects in the scene need to be able to create other objects. The ship needs to be able to create a bullet. And that instantly has huge ramifications because what's to stop a ship from making thousands of bullets? So I would, at that point, update the fitness function to check that, like, maybe every frame, the number of objects in the scene is, like, the same as what I'm expecting it to be. So, yeah, you can totally change the fitness function to adapt it for whatever sort of thing you're trying to make. My vision is very much like you would have um, different, like, if, what I'm building at the moment is very much suited for top-down games more than anything, but if I wanted to build a platformer, it would probably have a different fitness function, or if I wanted to build a first-person shooter, it would probably have a different fitness function, or if I wanted to build a program to allow people to build traffic simulations for a city, it would probably have a different fitness function. Um, yeah, so, yeah. That's my slide. Does not really work at the moment. Uh, it works for things like move in a direction or follow this line, which is actually quite, it, it's effectively doing regression analysis on whatever you pass in in a really weird way. So. Um, yeah, it's kind of surprising that it works at all. There's actually been at least three or four times where I or Michael have found bugs in Helix Pi that mean that it should never have worked at all to begin with. And things like the frame count not being incremented in the simulator, so like all of the collision and input and stuff, didn't really work. But, I mean... Life uh, finds a way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the things that I still need to do before Helix Pi is something that's actually really worth using. Right now, uh, the editor is quite bad. Like, it's I kind of assume that no one else in the world knows how to use it aside from me, um, which is kind of funny because the hard part of this project so far has not been the genetic programming stuff. It's been making an easy-to-use editor that other people can like come to grips with. Part of that, at the moment, you just kind of move things around and manually increment frames and stuff, but the way that I really think Helix Pi should work is um, I want to add recording to my games and pretty much instead of manually like saying this guy's in this position at this frame, this guy's in this position at that frame, I want to be able to just click a record button, nothing would happen initially, I'd be able to click on an object in my scene and drag it around and press an input down at the same time and it would just record the game as if I was playing it, record that into an animation that can then be turned into the game. And the reason I think that's so cool is because I imagine if I made like a Mario game and I made it that you can walk around, you can jump and stuff, but I came across a bug where, for example, I walk off a platform and instead of falling down, I just keep walking in the air. Normally, if you were going to fix that, it would mean going back into your code and saying like, am I like colliding with anything? If not, apply some gravity or, you know, apply gravity all the time and stop myself from colliding. The way as a user, as a game developer, you would fix that in Helix Pi is you would play the game, you would encounter the bug, go back, you would record yourself encountering the bug, create an animation from that, then modify the path generated by the animation so that the character falls off the platform, and that would be how you encapsulate that behavior of your game, and ideally it just magically creates it for you in the background. That would also mean that um, 
there's never been a way for end users to modify the behavior of the games that they're playing at runtime before, as far as I know. Um, so unless you're a modder, unless you're a programmer, it's pretty much impossible to change the games that you play. But Helix Pi, that would be something that's first class built into it. So yeah, I think it's kind of interesting. Um, I need to create a Rails backend or just any backend to actually store projects. Right now it's entirely in JavaScript and it just stores your projects in local storage, which is really icky. So um, I want to create kind of a GitHub style website where you can have profiles and you can have projects and you can like publish your games and other people can play them and you can pay me money and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. And I need to improve the genetic coding so that it can learn multiple things. Right now it's really good at learning how to do one thing but it's very stubborn. It, it uh, much prefers to stick with the things it already knows than to branch out and try new things. And that pretty much just means that I have to change the fitness function to weight, and I say weight like as in you know, heavy weight, uh, weight the different scenarios that you make, uh, the new ones more than the ones that it already knows how to do. But yeah, it's, it's always fun working on the genetic coding stuff. What else? What is my ultimate evil master plan? I kind of gave it away a little bit just then with the whole making a GitHub style like social platform where you can pay me money and you can you know make and share games. But pretty much, um, I want to break down all the walls around creativity and game development, and I want to really enable like collaboration for people who have never even thought about like making games before, have never even thought about making code before. But I want them to be able to go on there, and even if it's just like designers and artists making prototypes of the games that they've always wanted to see, but they've never been able to find a coder to get involved with, or kids in schools who have never touched coding before, don't even know that coding is a thing, but like like games and want to start trying to express themselves. Um, one of the goals that I'd really like to achieve is, is this 48-hour game development competition called Ludum Deer, and it's how I got a lot of my start in game development. I would love to see someone win Ludum Deer with a game they made using Helix Pi. Um, yeah. That's kind of the like sort of road that I want to take. Really, I don't care so much about beating the people who are making Call of Duty or really high performance, you know, 3D C++ games. I'm much more interested in the art and creativity and allowing people who have never made things before to start making things. Yeah, that is Helix Pi. Questions? Why the name Helix Pi? That is a good good question. Um, I really just wanted to name it Helix actually, but. It's kind of already taken for a variety of things, and I didn't think I'd be able to conquer the Google uh, search results for that. So I was just brainstorming with my friend Alex, and he suggested Helix Pi. And the reason he suggested it is because there is such a thing as a Pi Helix, and you know, it was like, oh, you call it that. But I really like it because, of course, there are a couple of other projects that have the Pi suffix. There's the Raspberry Pi, and there's Sonic Pi. Um, Raspberry Pi was originally named Pi because of Python, but Sonic Pi is named Pi because of accessibility and the fact that it runs on a Raspberry Pi. Um, so I chose to sort of try and take up the, like, I want to create a standard of, like, the Pi suffix being um, you are creating software designed for accessibility and designed for allowing people to create things who couldn't create things before, because um, I think that is something that is common to all of those projects. So, yeah, and also I'll probably make it run on the Raspberry Pi and maybe I can get it shipped as part of their distro if that's, like, if it ends up working out well. Yeah. A question, uh, like we're talking about evolution here, and evolution is related to the environment in which you live or interact, yeah. and the other individuals that are part of it, right? Uh, where, where's the boundary, how, how, what's, what are the, like, the physical laws that are not changeable in, the, in this system, and how, how do you separate that? Like, because I, I'm, I'm seeing you're trying to to get to the, to free the perfect algorithm that will give you the trajectory that you're looking for, but like things like gravity in the real world are immutable. Yeah. So how, how do you how do you handle that? How do you define the environment? So that's a really good question that I don't have a written solution to yet. Um, my the way that I'm going to handle it initially is to allow each of the objects to develop their own localized physics system. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, and so I, I will provide them with things like collision and velocity and like momentum and all of that stuff. Um, what I'm thinking probably is either it's going to be really easy to just have like a bunch of tick boxes and like a field to actually change the physical properties 
of your universe effectively so you could just tick gravity and then you could be like this object is not affected by gravity i'm still open to having like metadata attached to the objects that make sense for the user um, i'm also investigating the option of evolving the physics of the simulation alongside the behavior of the entities inside of the simulation so that like your game universe will, yeah, Andy's face accurately describes the technical challenges involved in that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm also like open to the idea of letting people write code at like a, uh, like define some basic sort of rules, like if you want to define gravity or whatever. Also thinking about like, as I said sort of earlier, it's probably impossible for me to create an API and a basic system that would allow you to make any game ever. Um, but it is probably really possible for me to make APIs that allow you to make specific perspectives or genres of games. So games that require um, gravity in a 2D context tend to be platformer games. So I could probably make an API where all objects by default are under gravity and then you can have static objects or whatever. And then I can like, if you, you could have a little thing up the top left that is like, what type of game are you making? Are you making a top down game or a platformer game or whatever? And it just changes like the physical rules of the universe. Yeah. But I'm just going to start by letting them evolve their own gravity. <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely one of the like general downsides of um, Helix Pi is approximate programming, um, and so things like do all of your like when you define an animation, how do you make sure that all of your animations move at the same speed from like scene to scene? Pretty much the only way I can think about it is you have to do it once and then record it and iteratively build on top of it and then just delete old out of date stuff. But yeah. We're running all in JavaScript. All in JavaScript. How many generations does it take to get a viable game? It really depends on the complexity of what you're doing. Um, Helix Pi only is not very good at building complex programs over time yet, and that's really about the learning multiple things. So generally, it only takes um, 30 to 50 generations to build a program that does stuff really like moves and moves to follow a line in a pattern, for example. Um, currently, the way that it works is I think it kicks off. 15 generations inside of a web worker and returns the results back and it takes like a second and a half to update every time or something. Yeah. Do you use uh, mutations? Mutations are still to be implemented. Um, it wouldn't be that hard and it will pretty much just be mutating one of the genes, um, either changing the arguments that are passed in or swapping it out for another gene or deleting it or moving around. Um, I have an open GitHub issue if you would like to make a pull request. <laughs> how, do you, how do you see the gene form? Yeah, that's a really good question that I wish I had had um, time to put a slide together for. Pretty much there is a cedar.js file that is takes in just like a number of individuals that you want made, a number of monkeys that you want made. Um, it comes up with like an entropy value for each of them that is really just like how much stuff is going to be in it. And it's like between 1 and 20 at the moment. And that is just the number of genes that you're going to have. Um, Eventually it will be recursive and will be tree based, so it will get passed through and stuff, but right now it's just you get a, in 1 through 20 genes. Those genes are, um, I can show you the code actually, it's pretty pretty cool. Um, doo -doo -doo. It's fine. Um, fix fitness and consistencies branch, oh yeah. So I have this cedar.js file, always start at the bottom. So um, cedar.make uh, takes in your schema, which is effectively <laughs> the commands that you're um, allowed to use inside of an individual and a monkey, and all of the arguments that they take and everything that you need in order to generate functions that call those things in an appropriate way. Um, and so this generate individual function, this is our entropy, 1 through 20, and then it just goes over that and returns a new node for each of those. Um, this is just the same as underscore dot times in Ruby, uh, but uh, sorry, times, yeah, number dot times, but JavaScript, whatever. And so new node gets a command, and a command in this case is any of the things in the API that do something, like set velocity, apply force, um, stop, and gets an ultimate, alternate command, and then returns either an unconditional a conditional, which is an if statement, or an if else that takes in schema and the command and the alternate command. And so we can have a look at those. The unconditional just runs the command. The conditional checks the conditional to check and then runs the command. Uh, the if else checks the conditional to check, runs the command, or runs the alternate command. So effectively, I have re I've created an abstract syntax tree of JavaScript functions inside of JavaScript. Um, and so those, the literal source code of a HelixPy program that I showed you 
it's not the truth actually um at all all of the like velocity and stuff arguments get passed into it because you can't you couldn't literally declare or you couldn't literally generate one of the sorts of programs that i showed you before without adding strings together and i'm trying my hardest to avoid adding strings together <laughs> yeah um this is kind of cool so yeah the get get random command um picks uh right now it's really coupled to how things work but it is designed in such a way that it's only a few steps away from being entirely generic at any point um and the only thing i really need to solve to make it generic is given a particular command, how do I come up with some arguments that are appropriate for this command? Right now, I've just been manually creating them, but there is enough metadata passed along with the stuff that you could do it. Um, yeah, that is how I create life. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the serialization that you were talking about before. Um, yeah, how, much, uh, how much space does your population um, take up? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't really know the answer. Um, it is something worth talking about though, because originally when I started doing Helix Pi, I started just adding strings together and then evaling it, and that was really bad, really bad from a performance and safety point of view. Um, <laughs> so now instead of doing that, I have, I, and then I moved to closures, so I would close over all of the API commands and close over all of the arguments that I needed, and that was great, it ran incredibly fast, and it was super, the code was super clean and obvious, and then I tried to serialize it, and I realized what I had done, and I realized that you cannot by any like stretch of the imagination, serialize a closure in a cross-platform way across browsers. So now I've started um, like all of the arguments that were previously closed over are now stored in an args object and are like passed into it. Um, but yeah, I can check how if we pi editor dot results results. Um, oh yeah, uh, serialize results. Um, how can you check a string length in JavaScript? Just dot length. There you go, 310,000 bytes. For, uh, that's actually uh, 24 monkeys. Um, I'm only using three of them though. Yeah. So, oh, that EV, Greg, Stan thing. EV is the left hand pedal. Greg is the ball, Stan is the right hand paddle. They each have eight monkeys that were provided back just in case I need them, but I'm only using the first one. So um, it would probably only be, well, an eighth of that in size, but yeah, kind of big, but um, a lot of new lines. A lot of new lines. Oh yeah, uh, that's because it's like making it actually, well, actually readable. You can definitely very readable right there, right? But um, yeah, it's it's, for the first time ever last week, I read the source code of a Helix Pi program. Like before, it was all flying in the dark. Like I just, you, <laughs> yeah.